All right, so yesterday we covered all the different kinds of energy. We talked about chemical energy, electrical energy, okay, we talked about nuclear energy, uh, and then obviously it, at the very end we talked about thermal energy and mechanical energy. And those are kind of the two big ones that we deal with in Science 10, thermal energy. And the transfer of thermal energy is called... Uh, no, heat, right, sorry, I thought you said heat, okay, so um, the transfer of thermal energy, that stuff you can feel if you stand next to a campfire, okay, that's thermal, you feel thermal energy, but it's coming to you because the transfer of thermal energy is heat, okay, the transfer of, can, of um, mechanical energy is called work. Right? So they're similar in that they both transfer energy, it's just they transfer different kinds. Now, the laws of thermodynamics okay, are super important in terms of understanding what happens to energy okay, in certain systems. So we've got to go over some basics first. Okay? Um, so the laws of thermodynamics essentially talk about this. They talk about the relationships between work and energy transformations. Okay? Thermodynamics, though, focuses only on the transfer of thermal energy, heat. Okay? Thermodynamics does not deal with mechanical energy because that's not thermal. All right. Um, so changes in temperature okay, are the result of work and energy transformations or transfers. Okay? It's important for us to realize that too. Okay? How do we know that? Well, because usually there's friction involved when you're changing mechanical energy and that usually produces thermal energy and that transfer is heat. Now, when we're dealing with energy transfers and transformations, we're usually dealing with a system. A system is a collection of interconnected parts or objects. Okay, so right now, our classroom could be considered a system. Within that system would be the heating pipes in the ceiling, the air that surrounds us all, each and every person in here, okay, the desks, the floor, everything. All of that is part of the classroom system, and there are interactions of energy going on all the time. One of the biggest interactions between the classroom surroundings here, the air, and each and every person in here okay, is heat, right? Believe me. I leave the heat off in this room, okay? And by the time you guys get here in period four, the temperature of this room has increased by three to five degrees just because there's classes of 25 to 30 people in here in every period, okay? Is your body temperature higher than the air temperature? Yes, okay? Your body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. The air temperature in here is between 20 and 22 degrees Celsius. And so as a result, Energy always flows from hot to cold. Energy is always leaving your body and heating up the air in this room. Okay, so I use student-powered heating in my classroom because it always works. Okay, except when it's 30 below, then I turn the heat on a little bit. All right, that's why it's always kind of cool in here. You'll thank me in June. In June, we also get the addition of thermal energy from outside. Okay, and if I leave the heat off, it might not be 30 degrees in here by the time you get in here. I kid you not. It gets sweltering hot in here. All right? And that's because, again, we've got so many people in here. Okay? Yes, we've got the sun outside, but most of the heat actually comes from the people sitting in the room. Okay? So that, that's all the parts of the system kind of interacting. So there's different kinds of systems. There's open systems, and that can exchange both matter and energy with the surroundings. Okay? Each and every one of us would be considered an open system because we've already talked about you can exchange energy with the surroundings. You heat up the surrounding air if you are, war or if you are warmer than the surrounding air, which you usually are. Okay? You exchange energy. But you also exchange matter. Okay? When you breathe in, you take oxygen from the air and when you breathe out, you put carbon dioxide back into it. That's an exchange of material or matter. All right, same thing would be considered when you eat, okay, when you go to the bathroom, all of that stuff is exchanges of matter with the surroundings, okay? So you are an open system. You exchange both matter and energy with your surroundings, okay? A closed system cannot exchange matter, but can still exchange energy. So that would be, let's say you put your sandwich in a Ziploc bag. Right? So you sealed the Ziploc bag, it is airtight. There is no exchange of matter between your sandwich and its surroundings because it's sealed in there. Right? But if you threw that thing in the fridge, okay, would it get colder? 
Yes, because it can still exchange energy with its surroundings. The Ziploc bag is not an insulator. Okay, so when you put it in the fridge, the sandwich is warmer than the air in the fridge. Okay, the sandwich's energy goes into the fridge, and eventually the sandwich cools off. Everybody with me there? So that would be a closed system. Anything that you can seal airtight okay, is a closed system. Okay, the last thing is an isolated system. For all intents and purposes, it is nearly impossible to create a perfectly isolated system because it would have to be perfectly insulated. Not only does it not exchange matter, it's easy to make a closed system, you just make something airtight, but to prevent any energy exchange with the surroundings is nearly impossible. Okay? It is nearly impossible to create a perfectly insulated system. Okay? How many of you have like a, a coffee mug that's in one of those like that's super insulated, can keep your drink warm for like four or five hours. Okay? That's only a closed system though, isn't it? If it's sealed up. Okay? The coffee can't get out, the air can't get in, but it still eventually cools off. Right? It's not a perfectly isolated system. To be perfectly isolated, you would have to maintain your energy at the same level, essentially indefinitely. No, water heater, if you walk up to the water heater, you can feel the heat. Okay, it's insulated, but it's not sealed off, right? Plus, it also exchanges water all the time, so it's not even a closed system. It's actually open. Okay, so something would have to be perfectly insulated to be a perfectly isolated system. The closest thing we have that humankind has built to being an isolated system would probably be the International Space Station. All right? It's up in space. Let's say it's not being supplied with anything. Okay, it is, but let's say it's not being supplied with anything, and it is essentially airtight and very well insulated. Right? It uh, it would essentially be close to an isolated system. It also is not perfect. Okay, it still does lose heat to the surroundings. It still absorbs heat from the surroundings. Okay, depending on whether it's in the night side of the Earth or the day side of the Earth. All right, everybody understand the systems. That'd be like an easy multiple choice type question, right? Okay, there's three options there, and I could make up some phony fourth name. Okay. All right, first law of thermodynamics and the law of conservation of energy. Okay, so the first law of thermodynamics, we could actually say, is the law of conservation of energy. Okay. So, what the first law of thermodynamics says is this. You can change the energy of a system in two ways. You can transfer thermal energy to it, expose it to heat. Okay? Or you can do work on it. That is, push it, pull it, kick it, something okay, that would change its mechanical energy. Those are the only two ways to increase or to decrease or increase the, the energy of a system. If there is no work being done and no heat being added, then the energy of a system stays constant because energy cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed. Everybody with me there? All right. Now, we know that energy can be converted into other forms. If a system, like let's say a roller coaster, okay, is going down the hill like we talked about the other day, it's losing some of its energy. But it's not destroying it, it's just turning it into other kinds of energy that are not doing any useful work. Sound, heat, etc. Everyone with me there? But the energy of the whole system, that is the roller coaster and its surroundings, okay, remains the same. All right. Yes? Yes. Um, I suppose theoretically, I mean your ears collect it, that's how we detect that it's going on, but it's not Sound isn't going to do a lot of useful work for us. Right? All right. Um, so the thing here to remember is what I just said here. The energy of a system can be increased in two ways. Either heat can be added to it from the surroundings, okay, or work can be done on it. Oops, sorry, did the wrong line there. Or work can be done on the system by its surroundings. Okay? Either one of those would represent an input of energy into the system. Okay, you could decrease the energy of a system in a similar way. The, uh, the system then does work on its surroundings or other objects, and it, as a result, loses energy. Okay. 
All right, so that's what that next sentence says. Okay, it says energy can flow out of a system to its surroundings. Okay, work can be done by a system on its surroundings. Okay, and those will both result in negative work. Okay, or a transfer of heat away. Okay, and that would result in lower energy. So this part here that's already highlighted for you. Okay, that is the law, first law of thermodynamics stated out. Okay, so it's just a restatement of the law of conservation of energy. Okay, um, so. All the, uh, all the energy, including heat, in a system and its surroundings remains constant. Whenever heat is added, it transforms into an equal amount of some other form of energy. Everybody with me there? Okay. So energy can't be created. It can't be destroyed. Essentially, if there's no work or heat being added, your initial energy will equal your final energy. All right. That's pretty much all that page talks about. Now, the perfect machine. Okay, there was this idea early on that you could build something called a perpetual motion machine. Okay, and a perpetual motion machine, theoretically, once it is put into motion, should continue to run forever. So why can't we make one like that? Because what? Nothing's finite. Um, okay. I, well, I mean, you mean time not being infinite? Okay. Uh, wasn't what I was thinking of, but I suppose it's partially true. Right. Nothing's 100% efficient. Okay. There's no machine that has parts that are in contact with each other that is 100% efficient. Anytime two parts are in contact with each other, there is what? Friction. And friction will represent a loss of energy from the system. Okay? There is no such thing as a perfect system because we can never make anything perfectly frictionless. All right? So energy is always going to be lost. Whenever there is a, a transformation of energy, energy is lost from the system. Okay? Now, even if we could overcome that barrier, okay? even if we could make the surfaces all perfectly frictionless, all we would have is a machine that runs constantly. It would do nothing else. Why not? Why could it do no useful work? Exactly. As soon as I hook it up to anything, it starts doing work. What's work? Work's a transfer of energy. It would lose energy and stop. Okay? A perpetual motion machine would have to eventually stop. Otherwise, it would be creating energy, which we know you can't do. The law of conservation of energy says so. Okay? It says you can't create it, you can't destroy it. So a perpetual motion machine, even if you could make one, would do nothing except run. It would just be a scientific curiosity. It would be 100% useless in terms of anything else. Wouldn't matter. It's, even if it was in space, as soon as I hooked something up to it, the thing it was hooked up to would take energy from it and it would stop. Oh no, space, there's energy in space. Yeah. Okay. And the friction wouldn't be eliminated either. As soon as two parts are in contact with each other, there's friction, right? All right. So the examples they give here, right? There's no essentially transformation that's hundred percent efficient. If I bounce a ball on the ground, it eventually, you know, lowers each time it hits the floor and then eventually stops. Why? Because each time it hits the floor, I can hear it hit the floor. Okay, that sound represents energy lost every time the ball hits the floor. Okay, there's also some heat, there's deformation of the ball, all of that stuff is evidence that energy is being lost, so eventually the ball stops bouncing. All right. Now, second law of thermodynamics. Okay, and the second law of thermodynamics is really why a perpetual motion machine cannot exist. Okay, the second law of thermodynamics says that energy always flows from a hot object or a high energy object to a lower energy object, okay, or the surroundings usually. Okay? So really important that we know the second law of thermodynamics. So for any perpetual motion machine, they're always going to be transferring energy to their surroundings because they are the higher energy object. That's why they will always stop. So these were some of the ideas people came up with okay, for uh, perpetual motion machines, machines that could run forever. Okay? They had this kind of pie-shaped one so that um, 
these the balls that were inside were never running like uphill enough for they had the ball on the other side would provide the kinetic energy to push the thing around but again what are the balls rolling on they're rolling on wood or whatever the wheels made out of is there friction there every time they roll you can hear them they're going to lose energy and eventually this thing is going to stop okay a lot of people like this one they're like well Coderre, that that magnet is perfect right it doesn't take any energy for that magnet it would just keep drawing the ball up the hill yes it would but every time the ball drops down it's got to go through this door does it take work to go through this door yep okay and eventually it's going to stop Okay. It just won't get through the door. They'll all pile up on here, and then they'll stop. Then it wouldn't be able to roll up. The other part of it is, as they roll down this part of the ramp, there's friction. So they lose some of their energy to friction along this part of the ramp. So energy is lost here, energy is lost here, and eventually they just don't open the door anymore. Well, if you put another magnet here, it's going to draw the ball back down the hill, right? I know a lot of people ask that one. At first, I was like, "Yeah, that's a great." Oh no, wait. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's just it is it's not going to work, guys. A perpetual motion machine. You can keep thinking about it. Keep thinking about it. No one's ever. If you come up with it, I will give you 100% in this class. Okay. If you can make a perpetual motion machine that will run until the end of the semester, I will give you 100% in my class. You would deserve it because you have broken all the laws of the natural universe okay? in doing so. You would definitely deserve 100% of my class because you would prove that I'm full of crap. <laughs> and you would deserve it. All right. Remember, a perpetual motion machine cannot have a power supply. Okay? A power supply is an input of energy. It must not have that. Okay? It must run on its own entirely. All right, so the idea behind the second law of thermodynamics is the idea behind engines and, and things like that. The most simple engine, and was mostly kind of a thing invented in people's minds, was the heat engine. The idea here is this. Energy flows from high to low. So with this transfer of energy, usually matter is also moved. Okay? If you can get something in between the heat engine, the matter carried with the energy that's transferring along should turn this engine and that could result in work being done. All right, so if you can place something in between the hot and the cold or the high energy and the low energy as the energy flows through it can do work and that work can do something that you want it to do. Okay, everybody follow me there. All right, that's the idea behind the heat engine. Okay, so the heat engine essentially harnesses the second law of thermodynamics. That's its kind of benefit. It would, it would theoretically be almost free. All right. Now, an internal combustion engine, okay, fuel in the combustion chamber burns at a high temperature, and when that happens, it makes the gases that are inside the combustion chamber expand. And when they expand, they push on the piston that's in the cylinder. Okay? And they push the piston down, and when that happens, that's the power stroke. Okay? That's where the... Uh, the work is done by your motor. Okay, that's where it generates power that propels your car along the road. Okay. All right. Um, now, the big thing here about these heat engines is there has to be a pretty big temperature difference between the hot side and the cold side. Okay, this was somebody's design for essentially a 100% green heat engine that could power a boat. Okay, they said. Well, the water at the surface of the ocean is warmer than the water at the bottom of the ocean. And they're absolutely right about that. Okay? There's several degrees difference. Not a lot, but several degrees. Okay? So you got this long pipe that goes very, very deep into the ocean, and you have this short pipe that is in the warmer water. Okay? Energy should flow from hot to cold through the turbine here on this boat, okay, and down into the cold water. It's wonderful in theory. Why doesn't it work? Well, there's not enough, yeah, kind of pressure and not enough of a temperature differential, but here's the other problem. This hot water and the cold water down below, they're already in contact with each other. Why would they flow through the engine to get to each other? 
doesn't make any sense. Okay? There's already naturally convection currents okay, that are making hot water rise and cool water descend already going on in the ocean. There's zero motivation for the water to go through there in order to do that. Okay? So it just doesn't work. Right? It's a wonderful idea, but in practicality it won't work because the temperature difference simply isn't big enough. Okay? The warmest part of the ocean, the water might be 25 degrees. Okay? And obviously down in the deepest parts of the ocean, the water's you know, maybe near freezing. Okay? Obviously not much below freezing, or it would freeze. Okay? But okay, it's going to be low temperature, but it's still not a lot of difference in temperature, so not a lot of movement going on. And this isn't very practical. Having a really long pipe stretching down underneath your boat's not very good if you come near shore because you'll break it. So again, not not a really great design. Good in theory, but not good in practice. All right. So the big thing to remember here, guys, is that the second law of thermodynamics tells us which way okay, energy flows. Energy always flows naturally from hot to cold, but never naturally from cold to hot. Okay? You cannot transfer coldness. Okay, we talked about that the other day with the ice cubes. You don't transfer coldness, you transfer heat. The ice cubes absorb the heat from your drink and make your drink colder as a result. All right, heat engines and heat pumps. Okay, heat engines. The jet engine is an example of a heat engine. All right, it uses the same idea as that boat I just showed you, except the distance over which it happens is much shorter, and the temperature difference between the combustion area where the fuel is burned and the surroundings is huge. All right? When you burn JP5 jet fuel, it gets really, really hot. It's essentially just kerosene. Okay? That's the stuff that you would use in a camp stove. All right? So it's really good for cooking stuff. It gets really, really hot. All right? When you burn that in here, air tries to move through because there's hot and cold, and so air moves through, okay, and it turns the turbine. Okay, everyone with me there? All right, that's how a heat engine works. Now, a heat pump works the other way. Okay, heat pumps okay, will use mechanical energy, okay, and they will um, try to pump heat into the hotter area. All right, so essentially, they go against the second law of thermodynamics. You can do that as long as you use mechanical energy in the process. So you have to actually use energy to transfer energy. Is it very efficient? No, but you can do it. It's how your refrigerator works. It's how your air conditioner works, if you have one of those. All right. Um, so, like I said, heat engines and heat pumps are similar. They both operate that heat flows naturally from hot to cold. Okay, But okay, there's an important difference here that we'll talk about. So a heat engine okay, is essentially like a thermoelectric converter or a jet engine or something like that. Okay, and they are using the fact that energy will flow from hot to cold. This will actually work. This is a thermoelectric converter. Okay? If you have really hot water in one beaker and really cold water in the other and you put metal okay, and you connect it to an electric motor, the heat transfer, the movement of the uh, particles in the metal will actually run the motor. How long will the motor run for? Okay, as long as there's heat in the water or until the two beakers are, well, not empty, the same temperature, right? Until there, once, once that difference in temperature has been balanced, then there's no flow through the electric motor anymore. So actually, the motor will continually run slower and slower and slower as the difference in temperature between the hot water and the cold water is balanced out. Okay, it would work, but it I means it's not something that you could keep on forever. All right, um... I just want to see if there's something here, friction, yeah. All right, so for the heat pump, okay, um, heat pump works a little bit differently. So in your refrigerator, okay, it, the thing you can hear in there in the refrigerator is called the compressor, okay? What the compressor does is it moves fluid, a refrigerant. used to be Freon, now it's something else because Freon's bad for the ozone layer, okay? But you, now it's this, this refrigerant. This refrigerant changes state from liquid to gas right around the temperature you keep your, your refrigerator, okay? So it's convenient in that way. So what happens is your compressor takes it as a gas and compresses it. And when you compress a gas under enough pressure, you turn it into a liquid, all right? When that happens, heat is released lots of it. All right? So if you've ever felt when you hear your fridge running, you can put your hands down by the bottom of the fridge and you can feel hot air coming out from under the fridge. Okay? That's the heat that your fridge is absorbing from the food inside. 
All right? The energy from the food inside changes the refrigerant from a liquid to a gas. And then that gas gets pumped back down to the compressor, which forces it back into a liquid state. The energy it absorbed from your food gets blown out into the room. Everyone follow there? Okay, that's how your fridge works. It's also how your air conditioner works. It takes the energy from the air in your house, makes it change the state of the refrigerant, and then pumps the air outside. Okay, pumps the heat outside, forces it out there with a fan. You have to use energy in order for this to work. It won't happen naturally. So, by that reasoning, how many people saw the episode of The Simpsons where Homer tried to use his refrigerator as an air conditioner? Okay, he made like a little tent. He put a blanket over the refrigerator, opened the door, and just sat there. Okay, why won't that work? I mean, it destroyed his fridge. Why does it do that? Yeah. He, he essentially enclosed the hot air as well. So he opened the door from the fridge, right where the fridge was trying to pump the hot air it was taking out of the fridge, too. So it kept pumping the heat out, and then having to work harder and harder because it kept pumping that heat out, it had to keep refrigerating that heat, it kept pumping out, and eventually it just destroyed the compressor. Okay? It was always pumping the heat back into the place it was trying to keep cold. A heat pump won't work if you're doing that. You have to pump it outside, okay, away from the environment. Right? That's why your parents always yell at you, close the fridge door, close the door from outside, okay, because you're letting all the heat in, okay, if it's a hot day, not a cold day, obviously. It could still work, but you would still be, it would still be hard on your fridge because it's now refrigerating a much greater volume than it's supposed to, and it's got a 37-degree object in it all the time. Okay, you don't usually have something that keeps its own temperature in the fridge. Okay, constantly producing heat. The gas is in there; it's sealed in. If you ever look at the back of your fridge, there's little uh, pipes, little copper pipes that run all around in kind of a grid. Okay, uh, and they pick up they pick up that energy. So it's all sealed in there. That's why you can't just take your fridge to the dump and throw it out. Okay? They have to actually take the compressor and take the refrigerant out. If you get your air conditioner your car recharged, they have to take the refrigerant out. It has to be properly disposed of. Okay? So yeah, it's not just taking that gas from somewhere. It's already in the fridge when the fridge is built. Okay? So does that make sense there, guys? So a heat pump goes against the laws of the second law of thermodynamics and actually pumps the energy back out okay, into the hotter area. But again, that takes energy. Refrigerators and air conditioners are the biggest users of electricity in your house okay? because they are trying to do something nature doesn't want them to do. Okay? So they use a lot of energy. The refrigerant is a different chemical. Freon, when it went into the environment, uh, did something that reacted with, with the atmosphere and ozone and was bad. Okay. Uh, the new refrigerants are CFC-free, so they don't have chlorinated fluorocarbons. That's what CFC stands for. Those are bad. Yeah. All right, so thermal energy. Okay in a heat pump is transferred to the surroundings, okay, even if the surroundings are hotter. Right? And that's why that takes energy. Okay? So that's what a heat pump does. And the heat engines, like we said, are like a jet engine. You have that hot area, okay, and you have the cold area, so energy transfers easily. All right, we've still got a few minutes left in class here, so I want you to do um, number three, number four, Number five, number nine, and we already talked about number 11, so we don't have to do that. Um, I'm missing one here. Which one do I usually do? Oh, sorry, eight. All right, so I want you to do those ones that I've circled. You probably have time to do those. Hopefully, you'll have a chance to go through them before the bell goes. All right, so answer those ones, and we'll work on the rest of it on Monday a little bit.